It's the 10th of April, 1998. The leaders of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland are together to sign a historic peace deal that will end 30 long years of violence in Northern Ireland. This is the beginning of a process of change. But cut to 2021. Some are calling the worst violence in years. The violence in Northern Ireland was directed at these peaceful, but it was started with a border that separated the South and the North in 1921. This border was removed after the Good Friday Agreement was signed and it seemed like everything was gonna be okay. And it was for a long time. But then in 2016, the United Kingdom voted to leave the EU. Good afternoon, everybody. British people voted to take back control of their money, their borders, and to leave the European Union. For many people in Ireland, North and South, Brexit feels almost like a repartition of the island. One part of the island is now outside the EU, the other part is inside the EU. One achievement of the Good Friday Agreement was that it made space for all different identities in the country. But with the Brexit referendum in 2016, people in Northern Ireland were forced to pick a side once again. I guess something that I want to ask, how do people in Northern Ireland actually identify themselves? 56% of people in Northern Ireland voted against Britain leaving the EU. And that's mainly because being part of the European Union ensured significant trade benefits and no hard borders. But once the votes were in, UK has voted to leave the European Union. The border anxiety returned to Northern Ireland and its place within the United Kingdom was once again thrown into a place of uncertainty. I think we are forgotten about it a lot of the times and it's just sort of like, oh, Northern Ireland. And I do feel like the British government, they don't really want us. One of the solutions to the post-Brexit concern in the country, which is often proposed by nationalists, is leaving the UK and reunifying with the Republic of Ireland. But this decision sits on top of a long, violent history that divided Ireland in the first place. Today, I'm heading to Belfast, which was at the centre of this conflict. And then I'm driving across Northern Ireland to talk to people and understand more about how their lives have changed since Brexit and what they think about the question of reunification. So let's play this out. What happens if Northern Ireland decides to reunify with the Republic of Ireland? Brexit may have brought up this conversation again, but the question of reunification is as old as the country of Northern Ireland. And to understand that, we need to go back to the 1600s. This is when the Protestant English started colonizing the Catholic Irish. As the Irish started rebelling, the British released laws to suppress them. And in 1801, Ireland officially became part of Great Britain. Now, this was a huge victory for the Protestants, who were majority present in the North. But the majority Catholic population in the South, which wanted independence from the British, felt defeated. This is important to understand because it's exactly where the religious divide started between people, which continues to exist to this day. In 1916, the pro-independent Catholics launched an insurrection called the Easter Rising, which turned into a war for independence. In turn, British army and Protestant paramilitary groups in the North started fighting them back to ensure that Ireland remained part of the United Kingdom. About five years later, in 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed, giving independence to the South of Ireland. This is when the border between the North and the South was drawn, creating two separate countries. Before we continue this story, I just need to take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant. As I've been reporting on this video, I've spent a lot of time looking at numbers, statistics, and polling data. But if I'm being honest, at school, math was never really my thing. I was more of an arts guy. But Brilliant.org is the best way to learn maths, science, and computer science interactively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational to advanced maths to AI and data science, with new lessons added monthly. And my life right now is also kind of hectic. Besides making these videos, I am expecting a baby in two months. That's in case the baby wants to hang out in the studio. And I just moved into a new house, which needs a lot of work. So I don't have much downtime right now, but Brilliant was made for busy people like myself with bite-sized lessons that break down important concepts. So I've been using their mobile app to learn more about politics and polling for this video, as well as the physics of everyday objects in the home, whilst I'm out here having my lunch or commuting to and from the office. 
So when I eventually get around to doing up my bathroom, I now know how the physics of a U-bend in a toilet work. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, you can visit brilliant.org slash faultline or click the link in our description. And the first 200 of you to click the link will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you Brilliant for supporting the work we do. So let's now jump back into what happened after the island of Ireland was separated into two countries. Now, this seemed like a logical decision to maintain peace between the two countries, but there was a problem. A small population of Catholics were left behind in Northern Ireland. This gave rise to conflict within the country, paving way for extreme groups on both sides. Three decades of violence called the Troubles started in 1969, killing nearly 4,000 civilians. This is also the time when British troops were called in to control the violence. The presence of the British Army, especially at these checkpoints, was considered a symbol of British occupation that didn't go down well with the pro-independent Catholics. And it's worth noting that even though religion is being mentioned here repeatedly, the actual difference of opinion is on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, whether it belongs to part of the UK or Ireland. Unionists, who were primarily Protestants, wanted to remain a part of the UK but nationalists who were primarily Catholic wanted to be part of the Republic of Ireland. The Troubles was brought to an end in 1998 after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. I'm currently in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm in Ireland. This is the border right here. It's possible for me to do this because the Good Friday Agreement that was signed in 1998, and it meant a great deal for the people of these two countries. The biggest achievement of the Good Friday Agreement was the removal of the border between the North and the South, and the establishment of a new government representing both nationalists and unionists. The Northern Ireland Assembly was set up in Belfast. The process of devolution followed and ensured that Westminster government passed on the control over key areas, such as health and education, to the new assembly. The two big takeaways from the agreement was one, that Northern Ireland was to remain part of the UK, but the people had the power to change this for a referendum if the majority wanted to reunify with Ireland. And second, people born in Northern Ireland could now have an Irish or British nationality, or both. Armed groups were asked to dispose of their weapons, the British military scaled back, and the people who had been involved in the violence were released from prison. People were looking ahead, ready to move on from the past. For a number of years, both countries lived in relative peace, and the question of reunification didn't really need to come up. But almost two decades later, the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. Before we even discuss what that meant for Northern Ireland, remember that one of the main selling points of Brexit was for the UK to take back control over its borders. British people voted to take back control of their money, their borders, and to leave the European Union. And the government was so determined to achieve it that the majority of them didn't mind losing Northern Ireland in the process. And maybe you're thinking, Andy, is that really the case? Would they have actually done that? Well, according to a 2019 poll, 59% of Tories said that they would accept Northern Ireland leaving the UK as a price of Brexit. A majority of people in Northern Ireland had voted against Brexit because they knew the risks. Before Brexit, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland were part of the EU and operated under the same rules. This made trade between the two countries quite simple. But post-Brexit, the rules changed and the EU now required both border checks and increased paperwork for trading certain goods from Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland. This involved the risk of bringing back borders and security checks once again, triggering fears of violence from the Troubles. Obviously, the UK government didn't want to take responsibility for that kind of conflict. And so it came up with a solution. The Northern Ireland Protocol. Now the UK is no longer in the EU. This is one of the last examples of a physical land border between the EU and the UK, which means trading goods across this border is a real nightmare. It's a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork. That's where the Northern Ireland Protocol came in. Under this process, new security and document checks were introduced in Northern Ireland. But this time, it wasn't a land border. Instead, a border was placed here along the Irish Sea. 
and these checks had to be implemented even for goods that were being brought from Great Britain to be received in Northern Ireland. This made trading more expensive and delayed in the country. Businesses now had to fill in additional custom declarations and deal with complicated rules. You could see the impact of these delays in large retail chains as well. More than 380 products were unavailable in Marks and Spencer stores in Northern Ireland. The deliveries for John Lewis customers were put on hold, but the Northern Ireland Consumer Council said that nearly 300 businesses were not delivering to addresses in the country in June of 2021. And frankly, the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol went beyond trade and businesses. According to some unionists, it also created an invisible border separating Northern Ireland from the UK. And this started the conversation of the British versus Irish identity once again. I feel like Northern Ireland feels connected now to the mainland. No. Obviously, we've heard it all in the news and it feels like Northern Ireland has been sold down the river a wee bit, but like I, I still do feel pretty British. Purely from an economical standpoint, surely having that link to Europe makes more sense. It makes more sense to be a big happy family as opposed to a segregated, sort of broken off little chunk. Take a look at these two consecutive census reports. In 2011, 40% of people identified as British only, 25% as Irish only, and 21% as Northern Irish. In the 2021 report, this number dropped by 8%, and this increased by 4%. The protocol was met with a lot of criticism, especially from unionists. There isn't a single member of the assembly elected to support the protocol. And the last attempt from the UK government to fix that has been the Windsor framework. Now, to their credit, it definitely improves the earlier protocol by eliminating the need for any hard borders in Northern Ireland. It also introduces the Stormont Break, which will allow the Northern Ireland Assembly to object any new EU rules that they may not agree with. But there are still a few problems that it fails to address. And the biggest of them is the continued application of some EU laws in Northern Ireland. At the time of recording this video, the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland is yet to confirm whether they will accept this new framework. According to the party leader, Jeffrey Donaldson, the Windsor framework represents progress but needs more work. But irrespective of what happens with it, the loss of EU membership after Brexit remains one of the biggest triggers for Northern Ireland to reconsider reunification. Because earlier, being a part of the UK, which was a part of the EU, ensured political and financial stability for the country, among other things. But over the last few years, all those things have changed and mostly for the worst. So I wanna hear this argument out. What are the benefits of reuniting with Ireland? Possibly the biggest advantage is membership of the EU, easier trade with the removal of all barriers to businesses, and the possibility of gaining additional representation in the European Parliament. Some also argued that this gives Northern Ireland soft power in international politics, with support coming from other EU member states. The second big benefit is to avoid any borders between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. This puts away the risk of violence within the country. And thirdly, reunification also gives Northern Ireland an opportunity to have a stronger and more independent identity. It could also give a fresh start to both countries to move on from their violent past and establish a unified independent country for its people. In theory, the idea of reunification could work and there are people willing to look forward to that future. But over the few days I spent in Northern Ireland talking to people and visiting different neighborhoods, I realized that the reminders of its violent history are still very much alive. And it's not difficult to understand why some people may still be wary of that history and find it difficult to put the past behind them. So this is one of the peace walls in Belfast. He's back onto people's houses. These walls are evidence and symbols. A lot of people still want that divide. Like the people that live in each side of these things are walking up and down, spending a lot of time in these roads. Each road effectively is an echo chamber of the history of the country. So they're being continually fed the problems. Imagine you're living on these roads and you're walking up and down, you're seeing all this every day. It's just gonna be handed down through all the generations as they go. We're now in Derry, or London Derry, depending on what you call it. And right now we're looking over into the fountain, which is home to loyalists who believe that they are still under siege from the Catholics on the other side. If you want proof of that, just look at the paving stones here. Union Jacks painted all the way up and down. And the sign here, still under siege, no surrender. 
you can do your research and know so much, but if you're not here and understanding the deep-rooted history of the politics, it's very hard. Also, we're now like in a more open area, but if in shots you see that I've gone quite quiet, it's because we're in an area where I'm trying to hide my British accent. Pop for those, you Where are my films? He's Bristol. Bristol. Two hours later. He's all the way over there. I said to him, just remember, we're currently on the Republican side of the wall. He's wandered around there with his ankles out in his jeans and his very, very broad English accent. Don't be wandering too far, fella. You're on the wrong side of the wall for that accent. You know, nationalists, of course, they will want it to go towards more of a United Ireland. Is it going to benefit us more? I honestly don't know. And it's sometimes I just wish we could get along and religion just did not come into things that decisions being made about this country. The risk of reunification goes beyond triggering the violence from the past. According to economists, it could have a long-term impact on the country's public finances, possibly leading to debt problems. Not to forget the cost of potentially losing the British trade market, as well as making up for the roughly 10 billion annual subvention in Northern Ireland that comes from London. Another big concern is also about losing access to the National Health Service and how the country would deal with an additional 1 1.9 million people to care for. The hesitance to pay for this reunification also becomes clear when only 22% of people are prepared to pay more tax to fund the process. My clear sense is that we're in what I would describe as a pre-referendum phase. What I mean by that is it's clear that political parties who are advocating constitutional change are getting ready. In the Irish Parliament, the Oireachtas, there's recently been a Shannad committee on the constitutional future. So to my mind, yes, there's an awareness that this may be coming, not imminently, but it is on the horizon. I spoke to a lot of people who had their opinions on the entire situation, but it was interesting for me to see that a lot of them were tired of keeping up with this situation and had simply tuned out or given up on politics. Like I've seen American politics, it looks like comedy and Irish is like coming into a comedy. It's, there's no, no one you can trust. And it's just, you can't take them seriously. Politicians just comes around, maybe about a month before the election, just begging their vote. Then you never see them in for a year. They're useless. They don't help anybody. Everything comes down to religion and it just will not allow this country to move forward and it's the politicians who are doing this. If you ask a lot of the young people, my children, I, I don't bring them up to be thinking about you're a Catholic or you're a Protestant. Everybody's moving away. It's like there's no doctors, there's no teachers, there's no nurses. If Northern Ireland decides to reunify with the Republic of Ireland, there is a potential to work together to create a country for the next generation that is not stuck in the past. But that comes with a huge risk of creating even more political and financial instability, along with the responsibility of ensuring peace. Whether or not the reunification should happen is not my question to answer. It's become very clear to me that my British identity is very different to the British identity of the people here in Northern Ireland. We have lived through very different histories and grew up in very different political contexts. So the answer really needs to come from people who will be impacted by the decision. But irrespective of what happens, Brexit has clearly pushed Northern Ireland to take a stronger stance for its identity and its future, whether it involves negotiating harder with the UK or considering reuniting with the Republic.